Hi, I'm Daniel Fisher here at Sweetwater Sound, and this is another episode of Synth Clips. Today we're going to do envelopes. And in this episode, I'm not going to do so much envelopes going to something else, because that's actually a full episode. Um, but I just want to talk about the functions of envelopes, um, what each knob does, and a way of thinking about envelopes that's independent of what they're going to. I don't want you to think about envelopes in terms of filtering or amps or pitch or anything else. I want you to just think of them as a control source by themselves. And they're really very powerful tools and they're really ingenious tools. Um, it's very surprising that with just four parameters, attack, decay, sustain, release, uh, that you can mimic so many things in real life, how they move in time, uh, how their intensities move in time. This particular one is an ADSR. Uh, there are simpler versions. There's just an AR, which means if you hit it, you have the time it takes to grow, and then it'll stay up top until you let go of the key, and then it falls at the release rate. There's ADs, which are attack decays. You hold a key, it goes up till it hits max, and then immediately comes to min at the decay rate. Um, but these are ADSR, and um, a little later in this video, we're going to go into the more complex ones that have a delay before the attack, decay, sustain, release, and that in between uh, attack and decay, there's a hold parameter. And then we're going to get really into the nitty gritty and talk about curves in between each of those segments. So exciting stuff. Uh, and we're going to start here on the glorious Moog Grandmother, uh, an all analog, beautiful synthesis, uh, no presets. It's all about uh, patching, um, although it's semi-modular, so you don't have to patch. We're going to, to demonstrate something. But um, the first thing, I, like I said earlier, is that I don't want you to think of envelopes as a filter thing or as an amp thing or as anything other than a controller. Try to think of it as its own separate thing. If you assign it in your mind to a filter or an amp, what you're really hearing is the connection from the one to the other as opposed to what it does all by itself. And one of the ways to help you break out of that is to send envelope to pitch. Now, I'm gonna recommend that in other segments too when we talk about LFOs and other complex modulators that it's really hard for your ear to hear what it's doing especially when it's going to volume or filter or panning or some other thing, um, your ear is most sensitive to pitch. So while I can demonstrate an envelope to amp, and I do that by setting this VCA mode to envelope, and now if I turn the sustain all the way down, have the attack very quick, the decay at medium and the release very quick, uh, as I hit the key, it's going to grow quickly and then fall at a medium rate to zero. And that's what it did. But hearing changes in amplitude is not as easy as hearing changes in pitch. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set that back to just be a, a wide open sound, not affected by the envelope. And then I'm gonna take the envelope out. And if I go directly to pitch, it's gonna be pretty crazy. Okay, so to make it more controllable, I'm gonna use an attenuator um, that basically just reduces signal uh, amounts of control signals. So I'm gonna go into the attenuator, out of the attenuator, and back into pitch. Now this one is what we call an inverting attenuator uh, in that it can both uh, cut uh, amounts uh, where it's in its normal polarity positive, or I can cut amounts while it's upside down. And so at 12 o'clock, that's zero, so you're not gonna hear any pitch change. And as I turn to the right, you're gonna hear the pitch go upward based on the envelope. And the more I turn, the more that uh, total throw is gonna be. And if I go lower than 12 o'clock, now I'm gonna scoop under and come up. And if I go all the way, it's gonna go really low. Upside down envelopes are definitely something to try when you're bored of regular sounds and you wanna do something really different. Inverting your envelopes is always a really good way to go. But I'm not gonna do that right now. Right now I'm just gonna have a medium throw. And now, 
you're going to be able to hear the effect of the envelope much better than if I was just doing it to volume. So there is no envelope control of volume right now. And another thing unique to the grandmother and the matriarch and really old school Moog modulars is that um, they treat the sustain differently. In the old Moog modulars, the sustain is the bottom knob. So instead of ADSR, it's ADRS. Um, the other thing is on the grandmother and matriarch to really kind of show that sustain is different than the other three, it's on a slider, whereas the other three are on knobs. And that's because the attack, decay, and release are all rates of time, and the sustain is a level. And, that's, and so now, very specific directions. Uh, if I were teaching a class, I would say, this is a testable question. And that is, I need you to know that attack is the time it takes to get from minimum to maximum. That's it. You press a key, time it takes to get from minimum to maximum. The decay is the time it takes to get from max to the sustain level. And then release is the time it takes to get from wherever the envelope currently is when you let go of the key to zero, to minimum. And I say it that way so that I don't have any reference to filtering or volume or any other preconceived notion of what that envelope's going to. It's just what the envelope does all by itself. So again, attack is the time it takes to get from min to max. The decay is the time it takes to get from max to the sustain level. And then it sits at the sustain level for as long as you're either holding the key or standing on a sustain pedal. And then when you let go, it goes into the release. But what I don't want you to have in your mind is that release is always from the sustain level to min because you can get to the release time from anywhere in the envelope. So if you have a slow climbing envelope uh, with slow attack time and then you let go of the key, wherever it is at that moment, that's when it starts the release time. So just a crucial thing to understand and it'll be really easy to demonstrate now that I'm using an envelope on pitch instead of volume. So if I take the sustain level all the way up it's, and have the attack time instant, it's just gonna jump right up to that pitch. Okay, and then when I let go, it's, it's ramping down uh, back to no effect at all. And if I turn the attack time up, you can hear it's slowing. And if I turn the decay up some and lower the sustain a little bit, it's gonna go up to max and then fall down. to that spot and stop. In fact, if I hold the key, I can actually move the sustain and set it to where I want it to end up. So I can actually pick the note it's gonna to fall to. And then I have the release at zero, so no matter where I let go, it's gonna immediately fall back down at the release rate. So I can let go while I'm climbing. I can let go during the fall of the decay. Okay. So now if I set it to drone, so there's no volume change at all, um, I'm going to show you that if I hold it long, it will be short. And if I play it short, it will be long. Um, and that's because my decay will be short, but my release will be long. So if I hold it, it's very quick. But if I do this, it will be much longer. So it is interesting um, that an envelope is flexible enough. And now and I'm going to set it back to volume. I'm going to take my pitch change out of here. And it's flexible enough that I can make it that a short performance actually rings long and a long performance ring short. So here it is, I'm going to have my release up high, but my decay short. I'm gonna hold a long note, and it's gonna go up and end pretty quickly. But if I flick it, it will actually go quite a bit longer. In fact, I can make that even more uh, dramatic by shortening the decay time even more. So now, again, long notes are very short. And short notes, very long. All right, so now I have the ASM Hydrosynth up. Um, I'm using this one for this part of the demonstration because it has 
more segments than just ADSR. It also has a delay that waits before it gets to the attack and it has a hold which it holds at maximum for a certain amount of time in between the attack time and the decay time. And I'll start on volume and volume you can see the amp here is connected to envelope two. So if I just touch envelope two, I know I'm playing with the envelope that has to do with volume. It's currently in its init because I had hit the init button, which has an instant attack, an instant decay, a sustain at full, and an instant release. So it's very what we call an organ envelope. And if I adjust some of these, you can actually see um, that it is an instant attack, an infinite, a hold as long as I hold the key, and then an instant release coming back down. Again, like I showed in the other one, if I turn my sustain level to zero, I can have a slow attack with a quick decay, which gives you a nice backward sound. And now adding some decay. and then release, which is the time after you let go, wherever it is in that stage of the envelope, that's how long it takes to fall to nothing. Okay. So if I do it long, I mean, I could do it 60 seconds, I won't make you wait, but it would take <laughs> 60 seconds to get down from silence from that. So the first one I wanna show you, I'm gonna go back to the most basic instant attack, instant decay, sustain all the way up. But I'm gonna show you this delay parameter, and that is from the time you hit the key to before the envelope starts. So here, clearly instant. So if I set the delay time to about one second, it's gonna take one second from the time I press the key before you even hear the attack, right? And you might think, why on earth do I need that? Well, usually it's not as useful by itself, but if you have multiple sounds, it lets you do like different bell type sounds or pluck sounds where there's a patang, right? So you can have one sound do the p and then some number of milliseconds later, you get that second sound and that is a very useful thing. It's very cool to have delay uh, as a parameter. So uh, now I'm gonna turn the delay back and now the next one I'm gonna show you is hold. So if I turn the sustain all the way down and I have the attack at zero, the decay at zero, the release at zero, um, I should hear nothing or maybe just the shortest little blip. And there's my blip. Nice blip. Uh, if you look at the screen, you can see it. It's very, very short. If you want a sound to sound fatter and more weighty, um, it's nice to have it stay at full volume for some number of milliseconds before it starts falling. And that's where hold really comes in. Now I'm gonna leave the decay at zero, the attack at zero, but I'm gonna turn the hold up for 100 milliseconds and what it's gonna do is stay open, currently 104 milliseconds, before it falls, which is gonna fall instantly, so. And now if I turn decay on a little bit, I'll show you the difference between not having hold and having hold. So here's a little quick decay, right? Now watch what happens if I have it just stay open just a little longer at max before it starts falling. See how it's a little more massive, a little more weight, especially at low notes. Without it, And so for, for something punchy, like 20 milliseconds is nice. And where did it come from? It's from the old analog filter days when they were overdriving the filter. Um, the volume would stay at max for a little longer than uh, the normal straight up and straight down because you're saturating uh, the amp and so it can't get any louder. And so it seems to kind of freeze uh, for just a short period of time, and it's one of the secrets of why older analog synths have a certain kind of punch. So it's a way of simulating that, but it's also just a way of giving a little more solidity to your sound. Definitely something to experiment with. So now we're gonna talk about curves, and, and I'll tell you, there are few things that let you finesse synth programming 
as much as changing the curve types on your attack and your decay and your release. And so normally they're what we call linear um, in that as I turn my attack time, it's going pretty straight up from the minimum to max over time. And so now one of the reasons that I pull out the Hydrosynth is that it has uh, the ability to change the shape of the curve of your attack time, the shape of the curve for your decay time, and the shape of the curve for your release time. And it can either be bowed out or bowed in, and it, it has very, very different qualities, and it's, it's a very nice way to finesse a sound. Um, I always appreciate it when a synth has that. And so if you look at the graphic, as I increase the attack time, you'll see that it's very linear. Uh, and by that I mean from the time you go from min to go to max, it's traveling in a very straight, predictable line. And you can hear that. And I can make it even longer. But now I'm going to go short again. And I'm going to show you that this straight line over here, I can bend it. And the way I get to it on this synth is I hit envelope two again. And now I'm on a second page and I have a parameter called attack curve. And right now we'll just look at it visually, but watch as I turn, and let me go ahead and increase the time a little so it's more obvious. Watch the curve on this. So what they're calling logarithmic is where it starts low, but it doesn't immediately climb at the same rate to full volume. It sort of hangs at the low end just a little bit longer, as you can see here. And if I go to what they're calling exponential, the initial part of the attack is actually pretty quick. And only as it starts getting to full volume does it slow down a little bit. And those are two very, very different attack sounds. So I'm going to go, I don't know, we'll do fairly quick, 104 milliseconds. And now I'm going to go back to linear and let you hear what it sounds like normal. There's a little meh to it. But now listen as I go to logarithmic. There's a like it, it's kind of hanging. Feel how it's weighted at the quieter end. And now if I go the other direction, exponential, it's quicker, but there's a little attack time toward just before I max out. And I'll make that a little longer and you'll hear it even better. So here is a logarithmic curve where it's going to take a while and then it goes quick. Now if I speed it up to the other, if I go exponential, it's going to go quick but then slow at the end. And granted, it's subtle, but when you're trying to get exactly the right bass punch, when you're trying to get the right guitar pluck um, or a mallet pluck or something, being able to adjust the attack curve is a huge thing. So now we'll put it back to exponential, I'm sorry, we'll put it back to linear and it's a nice straight line again. And we're gonna make the attack time very quick again. And now we'll make the sustain level all the way down so it goes down and turn my hold off. And I'm gonna increase the decay time. And that has a certain sound. Listen how it sounds differently as I change the curve. So now I'm going to have what we're calling a logarithmic curve, and, and you can see that it's staying louder, longer, and then falling pretty quick. But the time it takes to get to silence is the same. It's just where it's spending most of its time. So now watch as I, as I keep increasing this. has a very different feel. And one really easy way to demonstrate that is with an arpeggiator. So I'm going to turn that on, turn the latch on. And now listen as I slowly change the decay curve from logarithmic to exponential. Notice how it feels heavy now. And now watch.
But the important thing is that I'm not changing the total time, just how much time it spends at either the loud end or the soft end and the curve it uses to get there. And so it's, it's a very real thing. Without going into some specific sound, um, it's hard to demonstrate more than that other than just go in and try it. Um, use an arpeggiator and lock it or latch it or use a sustain pedal so that you don't have to keep playing and hearing it rhythmically really does seem to help your ear get used to um, the difference between the logarithmic curve and the exponential curve or just a straight linear. So anyway, uh, that's just this quick segment on envelopes. We're gonna do another segment on envelopes when they're assigned to something, but I thought it was really important that you understood envelopes all by themselves. Um, if you're enjoying this series, uh, there's a link at the info that will let you see the whole playlist in order. Um, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you have any questions about the Moog Grandmother or the ASM Hydrosynth, please contact your Sweetwater sales engineer. I'm Daniel Fisher. Thank you very much for watching.